On this Thursday night, two Edmonton police constables murdered. The latest Canadian officers to be killed in the line of duty. Their lives and sacrifice will not be forgotten. What happened and what we know about the gunman. Is the clock ticking for TikTok? Why the U.S. is threatening to ban the app. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the loss of two police officers in Edmonton. They were shot and killed early this morning while responding to a call about a family dispute. Police say 30-year-old Constable Brett Ryan and 35-year-old Constable Travis Jordan were shot before they could even draw their weapons. Police sources say the suspect is 16 or 17 years old. He is also dead. His mother is in the hospital. Heather Urex West has our top story on the officers killed in the line of duty. All morning, the line of officers continued to grow. Standing at attention outside Edmonton's medical examiner's office, their hearts heavy. Today, the Edmonton Police Service has been marked by a really an unthinkable and a horrific tragedy as two of our members have died in the line of duty. Constable Brett Ryan, a five and a half year veteran with the Edmonton Police Service and Constable Travis Jordan with the service for eight and a half years, were responding to a domestic violence call shortly after 12.30 a.m. Upon arrival, the two patrol members went inside the building, approached the suite and were shot by a male subject. According to Chief Dale McPhee, neither of the two constables had been able to return fire. Fellow officers on scene took the two men to hospital, and though they tried, they were unable to save their colleagues' lives. As a former police officer myself, this hits very close to home, so to all my brothers and sisters out there, um, my heart is with you. The suspect, a teenage boy, later died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The teen's mother is now in hospital with injuries so severe she is still fighting for her life. For residents of the North Edmonton apartment complex, the news has come as a shock. There's families here, there's children all summer long, there's children playing out front, there's people sitting on their, in their backyards. It's, this is just our home. Every day, families of the police officers send their loved ones off to duty, to work and hope they return home safely. This did not happen today. Tributes are now pouring in as people remember these two young men. One memory viewers might recall, Constable Travis Jordan went viral three years ago for an act of kindness as a snow angel. Instead of giving a woman a ticket for having a car window covered in snow, he helped her out and gave her a snow brush. Donna? Such a lovely memory. Heather Urex West in Edmonton, thank you. Four other Edmonton police officers have been killed in the line of duty since 1918. And across Canada in the past six months, seven police officers have died on the job. In December, Constable Greg Pershala was fatally shot in an ambush in Ontario. Constable Shailen Yang died in October in B.C. She was stabbed while assisting a parks officer in serving an eviction notice. Constables Devin Northrup and Morgan Russell were killed in Ontario in October, responding to a disturbance at a home. And Constable Andrew Hong was on a break from training when he was shot and killed in an ambush attack in Ontario in September. The Pentagon has released a 43-second video it says shows the encounter between a Russian fighter jet and an American surveillance drone over the Black Sea. The drone's onboard camera shows the Russian warplane approaching and then dumping what the Pentagon says is a plume of fuel on the unmanned drone. It appears the video cuts out briefly, and when it comes back online, one of the drone's propellers is damaged. The U.S. calls it an unsafe and unprofessional intercept in international airspace. Russia denies it damaged that drone. Poland's president says his country will send about a dozen fighter jets to Ukraine, becoming the first NATO member to do so. Four of the MiG-29s will arrive in the coming days. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has pleaded for months for warplanes, and this could pave the way for other countries to follow suit. Slovakia, Finland and the Netherlands have all said they would consider supplying Ukraine with warplanes. 
Now to a Global News exclusive. A resident of the greater Toronto area is wanted by American authorities accused of trying to purchase sensitive equipment for a tech firm in Tehran that supports Iran's military. Experts say the Iranian regime often uses Canada and Canadian companies to dodge sanctions and procure military equipment. As Jeff Semple reports, Iran's weapons produced with North American parts are now being deployed in Russia's war against Ukraine. This has become an important part of the Russian war machine. Kamikaze drones made in Iran. Video from Ukrainian police shows officers shooting down one Iranian drone. But another made it through, hitting a high-rise apartment building in Kyiv, killing four people. Iranian drones have bombed Ukraine relentlessly in recent months, capable of striking targets far from the front lines. They are designed to be used only um, one time. It's designed to inflict the maximum damage Damien Spleter's team of weapons investigators analyzed the wreckage from Iranian drones in Ukraine and made a troubling find. We discovered that they were heavily reliant on, on Western components and technology. He says more than 80% of Iranian drone parts were actually produced by companies in Western countries, including the United States and Canada. Global News traced one case involving allegations of trying to send drone tech to Iran to this home near Toronto. Hello. Hello, hi. Oh, is Bader here? No, who's this? Bader Faki is facing federal charges in the United States. The Indian citizen moved to Canada in 2010 and launched his own consulting business and tech company. According to the U.S. charges, between 2017 and 2018, Faki and his brother tried to obtain highly sensitive pieces of equipment for a Tehran technology company that supports Iran's military, including counter-drone technology and an industrial microwave system, which the U.S. says can be used to create high-powered energy weapons. Faki's brother allegedly requested an agent fee of 20,000 U.S. dollars for their help procuring the equipment, writing in an email that the company in Canada is taking a huge risk. Okay. We're here from Global News. We're just hoping to talk to him. Faki wasn't at home and did not respond to our list of questions. Eventually reached by phone, he declined to comment on the advice of his lawyer. I'm not a, I'm not a criminal. The charges against him have not been proven in court. According to this U.S. indictment, Faki's brother was arrested by the Americans 18 months ago and has since pleaded guilty to violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. Faki is also wanted by American authorities, but he's been living and working freely here in Canada and even applied for Canadian citizenship. Are you surprised to hear about a case like this? I'm not surprised. Um, I know that uh, people with ties to Iran's regime uh, operate in Canada. Last October, the Prime Minister announced what he called the most robust and comprehensive sanctions in the world against Iran. That is why today we're using the most powerful tools at our disposal to crack down on this brutal regime banning thousands of regime members from entering Canada and restricting financial transactions. There seems to be a real mismatch between the government's rhetoric and its actions. A Canada Border Services spokesperson said dozens of people with ties to the regime and its Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, had been denied entry to Canada, but none had been deported. We're not seeing any movement on the reports we've made um, in the, uh, sort of identifying IRGC members. This refugee lawyer and activist says police lack resources. Ottawa's announcement last year included $76 million for sanctions enforcement, but the RCMP says it hasn't yet received the funds. The IRGC has been circumventing uh, international laws for decades. They've become good at it. They're able to um, operate through proxies. In Faki's case, U.S. prosecutors say Iran tried to evade sanctions by sending the money first to Dubai, then to Faki's Canadian company. Faki allegedly purchased the equipment for Iran from a company in Massachusetts and tried to export it to Dubai, but the shipment was intercepted by U.S. authorities. Iran's weapons support for Russia in Ukraine is made possible by its ability to evade Western sanctions, adding urgency to calls for Canada and others to crack down. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto.
A new twist in the rattled banking sector. 11 of America's biggest banks have agreed to prop up another struggling bank, First Republic, by depositing $30 million into it. It's meant not just to stabilize First Republic, but to send a message to depositors and global markets that America's banking system is secure. And Gaviola looks at how Canadian banks are positioned to handle all this turmoil. This week, the government took decisive and forceful actions to stabilize and strengthen public confidence in our financial system. In Washington, more reassurances that America's banking system is sound. Deeply important when it comes to the financial system. It falls apart if people don't have faith in it. It's not about econometrics or macro or microeconomics. It's about consumer psychology. We saw hints of that this week with two runs on regional U.S. banks and investors rocked by concerns about the viability of long-troubled Credit Suisse Wednesday, sending its stock to record lows. Switzerland's central bank stepped in with a $74 billion loan. Credit Suisse has a lot of links to um, the financial sectors of other countries. Um, so it has operations in the US, in other parts of Europe, um, and more widely around the world. So it's, these inter it's the global links which are the real concern. These extreme measures are working so far. U.S. President Joe Biden has pledged tougher banking regulation, and the American Central Bank is guaranteeing deposits at all banks. Uh, we're already seeing the contagion uh, dying down in the states. It may take another couple of days. Markets do overshoot from time to time, and I think we have seen the markets overshoot. Investors are waiting to see where the next signs of crisis will flare up on the heels of this week's warnings from credit ratings agency Moody's about more pain ahead for the U.S. banking system. And even though Canadian banks are well-funded, diversified and more stringently regulated, a financial disaster in another country can spread here. During the 2008-09 financial crisis, Canadian banks were really quite well insulated from what was going on globally, uh, yet we still felt the ramifications of a financial crisis globally. When you have a fear of the, the entire system coming down, that's in a completely different category. I mean, that that's, that's catastrophic. The financial system is strengthened by confidence, weakened by fear. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. With all the allegations of state-sponsored interference by China, so much attention is focused on what's happening right now. Well, it's worth noting that 100 years ago, the Canadian government passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, banning the entry of virtually all Chinese immigrants for 24 years. As David Aiken reports, one senator is worried a proposed foreign agent registry could be the modern version of that law. In a word, they are three. It was the Liberal government of William Lyon Mackenzie King that passed what became known as the Chinese Exclusion Act, an act that came into force on July the 1st, 1923. Many Chinese took to calling the 1st of July Humiliation Day. The law banned any Chinese person from coming into Canada and required all Chinese people already in the country to register with the federal government or face fines, jail or even deportation. The Chinese Immigration Act, or better known as the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1923, had a dramatic and devastating impact on Chinese immigrants and their communities inside and outside of Canada. That law would stay on the books for 24 years until 1947. Even then, Canada put restrictions on immigration from China, restrictions not fully removed, until 1967. Senator Yuan Ba Wu worries that a foreign agent registry proposed last week by the Trudeau government will set up a new foreign influence transparency registry in Canada. Could be a modern version of that exclusion act. I would like to think that even advocates of a registry would agree with me that it should not be one that stigmatizes or alienates any particular community. Minister Mendicino. The government is taking advice until May the 9th on how best to create such a registry. We may need new laws to deal with covert, to deal with coercive and corrupt activities, and the registry may well help us in that direction. For its part, the Trudeau government says it is sensitive to the idea that a foreign agent registry might be seen to be targeting or stigmatizing a particular ethnic community. But the Prime Minister and his cabinet also feel that a registry of those paid by foreign governments is an important tool to combat interference in Canada's affairs. Donna.
Okay, David Aiken in snowy Ottawa, thanks. Canada is lifting its COVID-19 testing requirement for air travelers from China, Hong Kong and Macau. Starting first thing tomorrow morning, there will no longer be any federal COVID measures in place. The government says it has not detected any new variants of concern and the situation has improved in both Canada and China. Political leaders visit Amqui, Quebec. Coming up, the Premier's pledge after this week's deadly incident. At least one person is missing after a five alarm fire tore through a heritage building in Old Montreal early this morning. People living in the building could be heard shouting for help. At least one person jumped from a window. Nine people were taken to the hospital suffering burns and smoke inhalation. Some of the units were being used as Airbnb rentals and it's feared other people could be missing. Quebec's premier went to the small town of Amqui today to offer condolences. Francois Legault was joined by provincial opposition leaders. He promised to boost mental health services across Quebec. On Monday, a man drove a pickup truck into pedestrians, killing two people and injuring nine others. 38-year-old Steve Gagnon has been charged with two counts of dangerous driving, causing death, and more charges could be laid. Ultimatum ahead, why the U.S. is threatening to permanently ban TikTok. The U.K. followed Canada and other allies today, becoming the latest country to ban TikTok from all government devices because of national security concerns. Now the U.S. is raising the stakes. As Jackson Prosco reports, Washington is demanding TikTok's Chinese parent company sell its stake in the app, or it will be banned in the U.S. The clock is ticking for TikTok after a sharp ultimatum from Washington that could see the platform completely banned in the U.S. We have concerns, as we have said many times before, uh, about this particular software. The Biden administration is demanding TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance sell off the app. Increasingly, the U.S. and its allies view TikTok as a security threat, in part because of China's national security laws that give Beijing access to data from Chinese companies. This is essentially an, an opening salvo to perhaps try to enhance the overall protections against the app. In a statement, a TikTok spokesperson told Global News, if protecting national security is the objective, divestment doesn't solve the problem. A change in ownership would not impose any new restrictions on data flows or access. They argue that in their U.S. operations, they don't share any data with the Chinese government. They also note that they comply with Chinese laws. Those two things can't necessarily exist together. China's foreign ministry said the U.S. has failed to provide evidence that TikTok threatens national security. We always have that dilemma in the West, don't we? We, we believe in free speech and free competition in the marketplace, and yet we don't want our data to be scooped up and used for nefarious purposes. Concern extends far beyond Washington. Canadian officials refuse to comment on whether TikTok's ownership is currently under national security review. Ottawa recently banned the app from government devices. The UK did the same Thursday. It is both prudent and proportionate to restrict the use of certain apps. Concerns about TikTok run much deeper than just data. There are more than 100 million users in the US alone and increasingly control of the platform is seen as vital to controlling the flow of information and disinformation. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. And tonight's Air Canada is Appen, Ontario. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Our Nasser will be at the anchor desk tomorrow and I will see you Saturday for the new reality. Bye-bye.